this country is at war with Germany. With Germany. We shall go on to the end. I remember the sheets of flame which came up and almost blinded us from our guns. In Arctic blizzards between January and March 1945, the Latvian 15th SS Division, a corps of Russian front veterans, but most raw teenage conscripts from Nazi-occupied Latvia, tried to stop the Red Army sweeping across Pomerania, which is now Poland. One in three died. The majority never returned home. Hello and welcome to the World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. In this episode, I'm joined by Vincent Hunt, and we're going to be discussing Latvians fighting with the Germans in the Latvian 15th SS Division. Through interviews, diaries, and never before utilised sources, in his book Road to Slaughter, Vince has built a compelling narrative of desperate fighting as the Latvians were withdrawn from defending their own country into Poland. Well, Vince, thanks for joining me. Let's start with uh, Latvia. Prior to the First World War, um, it had been German, then it becomes independent, then it falls under Russian control in 1939. You know, where, where did that leave the people? Who are liberators? Who are not liberators? How do the Latvians see themselves in the, it, 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 during the Second World War? Very much as uh, caught between two giants. Uh, the Russians came in uh, as part of the deal between Hitler and Stalin. They brought in what, what you might call a class war. All the intellectuals are... Uh, uh, sent to Siberia or killed. It's really like a a reign of terror. Obviously, there is a a Bolshevik government in in Latvia at the time, uh, which has been enabled by sleeper cells during the years of independence. So there's a communist government in charge that uh, reports to Stalin. When the Germans come in, obviously the Germans have been uh, the dominant force for the past 700 years, there's a certain section of society, the Baltic Germans, which are removed from uh, Latvia as part of uh, this deal. The Germans come in, uh, they're welcomed in in Riga as uh, liberators. But actually what happens then is Latvia becomes basically a puppet government and the Germans start the Holocaust. They wipe out the Latvian Jewish population. It's such a tortuous history that it's it's sometimes difficult to get your head around it because the Baltic Germans were the the elites in the in the country and they've gone and then uh, the Jewish population were the the merchants and the professionals and then they've gone. You've got some Latvians were uh, were taken back to Russia when the Germans came in. Barbarossa came through Latvia. The Germans then mobilised in 1943. The Germans then mobilised the Latvians in a draft to plug the gaps in the Eastern Front. The Latvians found themselves fighting around Leningrad and Apochka and Veliki Luki on the uh, Russian Front. And, of course, the key moment is is the raising of the siege of Leningrad because then the Russians, uh, the Red Army, come sweeping back west and uh, the, there, there are two divisions, the 19th Division and the 15th Division. They're on the, the front line of the Eastern Front. Uh, the Red Army just sweeps through the 15th Division, absolutely smashes them. Uh, the 19th and the 15th retreat in disarray through the Latvian countryside, Madonna and so on, heading west to the Sigil de Ring, which is about an hour east of Riga. There they set up defensive lines to try and maintain the operation, the evacuation operation in Riga, and to strengthen the defences in Kurland, and also keep open the port of Liepaja, which is on the uh, on the west, Baltic western part of Kurland, to have this huge evacuation operation Hannibal, which gets hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Germans, civilians, military staff and also Latvians uh, back to Germany, big Germany, which is annexed Poland. The focus of this story is the 15th Division. The 19th Division stayed in Kurland and took part in the six battles of the Kurland pocket, which was basically like World War I in a place the size of Wales. 
absolute cataclysmic stuff. We had tanks and bombing and infantry assaults and Latvian on Latvian uh, combat in some areas. There are statues all around Kurland of a Latvian mother with two sons and one has gone to fight for the Red Army and one has gone to fight for the Latvian Legion and the entire families are torn apart. And at the same time as this, there's this huge population exodus. The Red Army uh, identifies all these people who are, um, say, anti-Bolshevik. There's a mass deportation in 1941. They send 15,000 people to Siberia, which you could say antagonises the population, but the population wants revenge. So when these guys are called up to fight the Red Army and stop them coming back, I wouldn't say they're volunteers, but they feel that it's their duty. Well, I was going to say, do they have an option to say no? They had three options. The, these are the choices in those days. They had three options, to join a Labour battalion, to to join up and go to the front, or to be held in uh, in a camp. These are SS units as well, aren't they? Well, they're, they're titled as SS, and this is problematic because, of course, Latvians were involved in, in enabling the Holocaust, and this is a shadow that's hung over the Latvians ever since. But because of the 1907 Hague Convention, the Germans couldn't conscript Latvians into you know, the German army. So they created a separate unit uh, and they called the volunteers, which causes a lot of grief for Latvians these days. And they called them SS, which causes even more grief because the Latvians will maintain... We weren't volunteers because we didn't have any choice. We were drafted and we weren't SS. But this is the stain on Latvia ever since. But presumably they're SS, so it's a political unit which gets around the Hague Conventions as opposed to a regular army unit. It's a get round, yes. It's, it's a way of sending lots of men to fill the holes in the Eastern Front and to uh, save German lives. It's funny, it doesn't make any sense, doesn't it? They're not worried about shipping Jews off to concentration camps, but then they're worrying about how they badge foreign recruits. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. One of the things that comes through this is that these Latvians, I mean, they they were tough. You know, the the Latvians have a a strong tradition of uh, of, of being fierce military fighters. I mean, they kicked the, uh, the Russians out in 1919. The Latvian riflemen from the First World War were among the decisive forces in, in the Bolshevik victory in 1917 revolution because there were lots of Latvians living in, in Vyborg, in Leningrad, and they were slaughtered in the, in the German-Russian uh, war. They were fighting for, for the Tsar. And uh, this is at the time of revolution, and, and the, the guys in the Latvian rifle, uh, rifle brigades were saying, OK, who should we support here? I mean, the Tsar is just killing us all. Maybe we should back Lenin. And so Lenin said, sure, you can have independence. So they backed Lenin. They were part of the uh, initial storming of the uh, Winter Palace. And then they proceeded to be the shop troops that took out all the opposition to Lenin and then went on to be a decisive force in the Russian Civil War. It's, it's just incredible. I was presumably some of these Latvians could have fought with the Russians, the Germans, and the Latvians as an independent between the wars, which is... Absolutely, yeah. I, I mean, it is incredible. And, and uh, you know, I, I've crossed Latvia a, a few times and I've met these guys, and uh, some of them are saying, well, you know, when the Russians come back in, I'm not scared. I'm not scared. This is what his granddad said. I said, why, why wasn't he scared? He says, well, you know, I was one of Lenin's men. I'll just show, I'll just show them my card and they, won't, and they won't touch me. But on the other hand, his sons went and fought for the Germans. It's a crazy switching of loyalties. And there's, there's one story in this book about uh, uh, a Baltic German who decided not to be repatriated, in quotes, to uh, to Germany because he says I'm born in Latvia I'm Latvian I might be a Baltic German but I'm a Latvian he says I fought for the Tsar I fought for the Latvian army and now I'll fight for the Germans whatever I do I'll do it to the best of my abilities I I, I did I wrote wrote a note to myself what's motivating them and in in a in an area with so many different uh, connections to various countries and nationalities it's quite hard when you put in a unit 
like that. What you know, are they anti-communist? Are they pro-German? Are they Latvian independent? You know, how does you know the division hold together beyond the fact that they're all from the same you know country, which is only a country post nineteen fourteen. Uh, 1919, sorry. This is interesting. They they certainly were pro-German. They certainly were uh, anti-communist uh, because of what the communists did to their grandmothers. They were fighting to stop the Russians coming back and repeating what they call the year of terror uh, of 1940-41, when basically all the opponents of uh, uh, the Bolshevik regime were taken out. So all the guys I spoke to were saying, well, I was fighting for Latvia. You know, I'm fighting for my homeland. And they could never go back to it. I I discovered (laughs) through the connections that I made uh, in the book about the 19th Division, which which came out in 2017, Blood in the Forest, uh, at the end of the Second World War in Kurland, that actually this this story of the 15th Division, the men who were moved back to to Germany to regroup and re-equip and, uh, and, and stop the Red Army when it crossed the Vista. They never went home. And uh, they ended up surrendering to the Americans in the West. And then they were hanging around in, in camps uh, in Germany, along with thousands, tens of thousands of Poles and Ukrainians and Lithuanians, etc. And Britain offered them the chance of work under the European Voluntary Worker Scheme, the EVW, Westwood Ho, in 1947. And these guys are saying, well, we're not going home, are we? We're not going back to a Soviet Latvia because we'll end up in Siberia. They were looking at the options on the table. Some had gone to Sweden, some had stayed in Germany, some went to Belgium, but 10 or 15,000 of them came to the UK. It's more than just a military history, this. It's, It's a story of of a Latvian diaspora, and also British society as well, because they came and they took jobs. Uh, Some of them went down the mines, some of them worked in agriculture, a couple of them became gardeners. You know, then they've stayed here ever since. They've assimilated. Their children are, as you know, Anglo-Latvian children as part of a diaspora community. I know we've skipped to the end. We'll, 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 We'll go back to Riga in a moment. But I was going to say, when they come over, do they actually form communities do they actually do they gravitate to certain areas where their pals are so do you find that in certain areas of britain has a large an unusually large stock of latvian descent yes you do and at the risk of this becoming you know a sociological uh interview uh bradford was a mainstay of uh of latvians a couple of guys ended up in derby uh, quite a lot of them ended up in coventry I met one guy in Kidderminster. I mean, I I have no idea how he ended up in Kidderminster. Well, I was going heavy industry through all those. Then again, I'm not sure what's in Kidderminster, but you know, Bradford's heavy industry, presumably Derby's heavy. Yeah, industry. engineering factories in Derby. Uh, there were lots of them in London, and w- what they did. I mean, it's it, it's it's really interesting because these places are just on the last legs of these of what these guys achieved. They came over, formed themselves into Latvian communities to keep the language alive and the traditions alive because all of this had been uh, ruled out by the uh, Soviet occupation. And so they have song festivals, dance festivals. They have a tendency to form choirs because they love singing. They bought a place in Catthorpe in Leicestershire, which was basically not a refugee centre, but a, a, a place where if you would a Latvian who was down on his luck, you could go to a place in London, you could go to Catthorpe in Leicestershire, and they'd let you stay there and get back on your feet. And they had holiday homes all around the UK, one in Wales, one in the South. And, uh, I mean, it's fantastically innovative what they did. And, and they invested in their own community, they kept the language alive, and they still do to this day. You know, you've got me thinking, because obviously the Poles do the same. I, mean, I used to live near a Polish centre in London, and I know there's one in Chiswick, and there was, there was one in Battle, and they're doing the similar sort of thing. Uh, there's probably slightly fewer of them than the, than the Poles. But although that said, 15,000 is a lot, isn't it? It, it is a lot. <laughs> it's a sizable amount to drop into Britain. One of the things that uh, also happened was when it was ruled that the Latvians weren't SS, America and Canada and Australia opened the borders, and so quite a few of them went there. One of the things that's that's interesting about this 
post-war diaspora is that the ones who were really badly injured, the invalids, appear to have stayed in Germany, particularly in Kaiserslautern. Ones came to the UK, but they had to pass a medical to go to America and Canada. And one guy had TB, and they said, you can't go. And then a lot of them said, well, we want to go back to Latvia. That's our homeland. But we can't because of the communist regime. But if the communist regime should fall, then the UK is a lot nearer. Well, let's get back to... I was going (laughs) to... They're, you've already mentioned they sort of get pushed back to Riga, don't they, the 15th Division, which we're sort of going to be concentrating on. And then they're shipped by boat uh, to Danzig in Poland. What I was intrigued about was, do we know how they felt about... One, they've been, now been removed from Latvia. So the excuse of we're fighting for Latvia starts to pale into ex- insignificance. At which point does their German heritage, if they feel that they have German heritage... Is that what was motivating? How do they feel about being withdrawn to Poland? Not very happy. One of the deals was that they're Latvian and they fight in Latvia, but they didn't really have a great deal of say. They're bundled onto ships. Uh, they're sent off with all their equipment uh, to Pomerania. They end up 60k west of Danzig in a place called Sofienwalde. And there's a huge training camp about the size of the Lake District. So they they regroup there, but here comes the next problem, because the Polish partisans aren't very pleased about having this huge German occupation. The Latvians used in anti-partisan pomer- uh, uh, operations in in, in the Sofienwald area. They suffer a number of casualties. Uh, people are picked off when they're on nights out. The honey traps, you know, girl in a doorway. Have you got a light, mate? and then people are bundled down the alleyway and and killed. They're there for a couple of months, and everybody knows that the Russians are going to cross the Vistula. The Latvians, uh, according to all the reports that I've read, are under-equipped, they haven't got uniforms, all the equipment, the Germans take the best equipment, they don't have proper artillery support, they don't have trucks. And then on the 22nd of January, they're sent south through Immenheim to Nakau to to stop the the Russian offensive across the Vistula. And then there they're smashed again. They hold out for a couple of days, but you've got tanks going round the back and you've got artillery. And according to one of the guys I talked to, he was a machine gunner. And uh, he says, OK, so what we were doing is we're in a first floor window. You get out the window you fire off a burst, and then you run for your life. This is because those the Red Army gunners uh, were so accurate that if you didn't move, you were dead. And so uh, a picture builds up of this terrifying uh, onslaught from the Red Army with tanks and infantry assaults and all kinds of things, and they just can't withstand it. And so they start to retreat, and once they retreat, they're in disarray for the next seven weeks. When they're, when they're smashed, is there any opportunity to get new recruits? You know, you're out. You're not in Latvia now. You know, do they start taking on? Or is it diminishing returns? You know, does the unit get smaller and smaller? Or, or is there other Latvians they can hoover up uh, to reconstitute the units? Not once they've left. The Red Army offensive is so strong, and it's and it's sweeping from uh, east to west and from north to south. So they're being sliced up into portions. They didn't have enough equipment to arm everybody. So uh, as a third of the original Latvians in Sofienwalde were left there and then sent to Danzig, where they were then cut off. So once these regiments of the 15th have, have left the base, they're on their own. There are military historians in Latvia who say that they made a fundamental mistake by going cross-country from Nakel, heading for the Baltic coast, and uh, that they should have gone north and joined up with uh, the German forces in Danzig. But then they would have ended up being surrounded in this in the siege of Danzig, and that didn't end well for the Latvians in Sofienwalde, who, who were sent to Danzig, usually unarmed. They were usually only issued with arms at the time. 
And one of the themes that comes out from the work I've been doing is the Latvians were always the first in the front line and the last to get the Germans out. Vince, we're going to pause it there. Folks, we'll be back in a moment. Welcome back. I'm joined by Vince Hunt and we're discussing the Latvian Legion. The story you tell so very well in the book is the 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 the, the, the fighting out of the breakout from the three villages at Jastro through to Landek. Uh, nowadays it's known as Yastrovi or Yastrov. Yeah, I'm not strong on the Polish pronunciation, but th- it, this is working in three different languages, this book. You know, it's working in Polish, Latvian and German. So they call it Yastrov. Then you've got uh, about 10k north of there, you've got Fladerborn, and then about another 10k up there, 8k, uh, you've got this place called Landek, which is called Ledicek now. Fladerborn is now Podgaya. And I first started to focus on this area because of this story that the Latvians had murdered some Polish prisoners in Fladerborn. The story, the, the big story, is that the Latvians retreated in disarray from Nakel and various other places, Vansborg, etc., and regrouped in, in Yastrov at the bottom of what I now call the Road of Slaughter. The idea was that they would go up to Flederborn, which was being held by the 48th Dutch SS. So that was holding that key town on a fork in the road. And there's there's a left-hand fork that goes to a place called Ratsabur. That was the escape route from the Red Army encirclement of that entire area. The reason I went there was to get an idea of the geography. And, and, and when you do that, you discover that this is a single road through fields lined with forests with a load of hills on the left-hand side. And guess what's on those hills? Artillery, machine guns... Uh, caduceus, etc. And you can see, you can basically pick the wings off a fly on that road. Absolutely horrendous. It wasn't called the Road of Slaughter until I started looking at uh, what happened on that road. And so the Latvians moved out of Yastrov, leaving behind a, a rear guard under the hero Colonel Yanums, Vilis Yanums, and uh, immediately, almost immediately, came under incredible fire. The road is choked with refugees who are also fleeing. This is very close to the Pomeranian Wall, and the uh, the Polish are moving towards to you know to take the uh, Pomeranian Wall. So everybody, the refugees, there are seven to eight hundred wounded on horses and you know wagons, uh, basically defenceless, and then all these soldiers who've got off the road and are trying to move through the forests and the ditches. It's absolute hell on earth and what i came across was uh, some accounts in the latvian official history which has never been translated into english i found an account from a, a priest a doctor a divisional messenger a vet who had all written their s- stories and i pieced it together chronologically so over three days the move up this road uh, they were pinned down, there were carts destroyed, there were horses dead in the road, the place is blocked, there's a roadblock on that fork left, so there's no escape. So the Latvians take over this town called Flederborn and hold it while the 48th Dutch SS is sent to try and break some of these roadblocks, both to the west and to the north. And at that point... The Latvians going into this town of Fladeborn, well, town, it's a, it's a village, it's a hamlet. They surprise the Polish from behind, rout them, take some prisoners, and then get their way into this little village called Fladeborn. They take some friendly fire, some casualties from the 48th SS that are holding the village, and then they hand the prisoners over to the 48th SS, who then proceed to murder them. But... I think, and there are Latvian historians who uh, have looked at this in great depth, that this is a smear, basically, to smear the Latvians with responsibility for this. Just quite recently, the son of one of the legionnaires got in touch with me and he says, I I need to tell you this, this is something that my dad said, uh, who was there, who shot these Polish, 32 Polish prisoners 
and there's a, a monument to them now there, rightly so, you know. But it's the only monument. There's no monument to the 800 Polish soldiers who were killed uh, trying to take Flederborn, and there's no plaque that says that terrible things happened here in this war and, and thousands of refugees were killed, you know, women and children blown to pieces by artillery. And so this guy says to me, he says, my dad was there. And he said, these guys, these Polish, were, were machine gunned on the icy pond. And this is something, this this story still isn't told comprehensively. You get that confusion of national identity comes in at the end of the war of of constructing stories to justify things, rightly or wrongly, and it becomes very difficult 80 years later to try and find a truth of which there, there is probably a mix of a number of stories that actually is is more realistic of the truth. And where is the truth? You know, the truth is all relative, isn't it? But what I'm trying to do is just assemble what people have said about this. What is memorialised now in in the villages of uh, Yastrov, Flederborn, and then to the north, Landek, doesn't tally with the, the human accounts of, of of what happened there. And I've, I felt, I mean, I'm getting my head, uh, ahead of myself here because we've got the intense breakout at Landek, which was... Landek, because all the time they've been funnelled along these roads, aren't they? It's a fantastic description of the book with the, with the maps to, to explain how they had literally funnelled along this road with the Latvians essentially in a permanent rearguard action, aren't they? I'm glad you mentioned the maps because important little, they're not pastiches, are they? But, I mean, there's there's a really, really important piece of combat where there's this guy called Lieutenant Eisen's Bonaparte who, from the first company, who, who had a group of guys that were called the Cutthroats. And Colonel Yannams, who was the commander, would say, look, See those tanks? Can you take them out? And those guys would go, "Yeah, they're gone." And and they'd be, they'd go, and before long, the uh, uh, you know the roadblocks would be cleared in various other places. But here in this village of Flederborn, Bonaparte, Lieutenant Bonaparte, goes back into the village to hold it as Red Army tanks are coming in and. People are descending from all sides, from left, right, from the south. Him and his 30 men go back and hold the village. And at one end of the village is their front line. And then at the other end of the village, the Red Army tanks and artillery. The bravery that is on display is just incredible. Well, it's part of desperation. I mean, I, I assume, well, what would happen to them if they became prisoners of war? You're right. Bravery is all relative, isn't it? Because... They, they had no option but to fight their way out because they would have been killed, they'd have been held prisoner, they would have ended up in Siberia because, you know, people who surrendered had fought against the, the Soviets, so they'd, they'd end up in Siberia. And presumably this wave of refugees will be ethnic Germans, not necessarily Lat- Latvians. So they, the Latvians are now fighting essentially for Germany, not at all for Latvia. They're, they're fighting for, for their lives. Uh, they 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 have nowhere to go. I mean, just imagine the scene. You're in this village. You can't go to the left. Uh, if you go to the right, you're facing roadblocks. There are tanks. There are. It's a single road through forest on both sides. In those forests, there are machine gun pits. There's caduceus that are zoned onto that road. You've got snipers in the trees, and you're basically in a traffic jam from hell. Uh, with all these smashed carts, terrified women and children everywhere, wounded people. What can you do? So it's absolute disarray and carnage. And as they proceed up this road towards Landek, breaking the encirclement at Landek is the only thing, is the only option, really. So the Latvians, along with their commander, Adolf Axe, who is a, a very disliked figure in in Latvian history because he just kept throwing the men into... But uh, he's a German. He's German, is he not? He's, he's, a, he's a Nazi. He's, uh, he's, a, he's originally was he a, a Belgian. No, originally Belgian, yeah. a Belgian. And, and they hated him because he didn't value their lives at all. They're proceeding up this road towards Landek, which is held by uh, machine gun posts and 
all this. The Germans have organised a, a, an operation from behind that roadblock on the bridge. So the, the Latvians organised this death or glory assault on, on this Red Army roadblock. Again, the, the word carnage is really the, the only one that I can think of. They basically rush this bridge while the uh, camp group Hamel come from the back and, and dislodge them. So between them, they, they break the siege of the road and the Latvians can filter through along with the 48th SS and, and various other units who were all on there. But many of the senior officers are killed in this assault. And that's why the accounts of this period are so patchy. Because nobody's taking the official war diary. Nobody survived. Yeah. And it's interesting you mentioned this war diary because when when you start looking at a story like this, I mean, I'm a journalist, not a historian, so I'm I'm looking for stuff that, it tells me about that time. I discovered that there actually was a war diary for the 15th Division, but it was missing for 60 years. And it had been sold back to the Latvian government in 2006 after being held for 60 years, probably under somebody's bed in Belgium, where it had been traded for a couple of loaves of bread at the time, something like that. So nobody had ever gone and actually published anything from uh, from this war diary so i asked if i could have a look and they said yeah sure i said can i take photographs because it was all held on microfiche and i said look i've got to get a plane i've run out of time and so i took photographs of these microfiches from this period and and we discovered the original orders from the road of slaughter and they are absolutely desperate. They run out of ammunition. They're radioing for, please drop some more ammunition or we are finished. This unit will be wiped out. Annihilation is basically the only option. And it just builds up into this picture of a really desperate situation where these guys have no option but to fight for their lives. They overcome seemingly insurmountable obstacles as one of the guys who was there told me, he says, well, it's a good job that uh, the Germans came and, and broke the encirclement from the back because I wouldn't be here to tell you this story today. It's peculiar because they could not be in German. They could have just have left <laughs> and, and not worried about it, blown the bridge and uh, covered the road back. So it's, why it's very interesting, the shift in ideas of, of nationality and where do they belong and not belong and actually... Do the Germans just see them as as comrade comrades in arms? You know there is a, a tension that between the Germans and the Latvians that that raises its head at various times. There are a number of disagreements that stand up rows between the German commander and uh, the Latvian officers who were Latvian army officers, you know, from the War of Independence and knew what they were doing. I would say quite experienced officers, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, there's a couple of them. I mean, there's there's Willis Yannums, who I've mentioned, who was the hero colonel, the, the Houdini-esque colonel, who'd saved his men on numerous occasions and uh, on the Russian front, and then in Pomerania, gets them out of 10 different encirclements. You know, I've seen his maps. His maps are a, a, a thing of beauty. He's shaded in all the territory and the swampy areas and, and stuff. Then there's this other guy, Major Keelitis, who is the one who was in charge of who took the prisoners and then was in charge of uh, uh, of getting his men out of uh, off the road of slaughter and into landing and he was having a stand up row with one of the german officers earlier german officers saying you take your men anybody who retreats will be shot you take that regiment and he says it's i, I refuse to accept these orders if you describe my men as a as a regiment. This is there are so few of us now, it needs to be described as a company. The casualties were incredible. That that was something that they are my figures. I am responsible for them. But I I wanted to know if this was such a scene of carnage, how many people died there? Nobody knows really who these refugees are. I've had a couple of people contact me from Minnesota in America to say, you know, his grandmother was killed on that road. His grandmother and younger sister was, were killed on that road. 
So yes, I, I assume that they were, were Germans, but it'd be nice to know more, wouldn't it? What's awful about it is nobody has really made an attempt to quantify what happened there. It's a story that people don't know about in Latvia a great deal because they've only got the, the military books to work off. And nobody seems to have sat down and looked at this period of Pomeranian retreat. But using the accounts from the commanders, the biographies, from some of the official history, and some particularly unpleasant incidents, including the execution of 600 uh, recruits by NKVD in Ledicek, Landek, and then a story of 400 young drivers who panicked under fire and, uh, and just ran in the forest, surrendered to a Red Army tank unit, and then were machine-gunned in circumstances very similar to those that the fate that apparently befell the, uh, the Polish. We pieced all those figures together, working with Ivar Sinker from the Daugavas Vanagy Veterans Association. And my estimate, including the 1,000, the 600 executed and the 400 uh, prisoners who were machine gunned, is that there were about 5,000 Latvians killed on that road of slaughter. That's a hell of a lot. I mean, it's, it's only 15, 17K along there. It could be an overestimate, but for me, it's, it's a line in the sand. The military historians think the figure is smaller, but they haven't got round to, to tossing this up until now. So every piece of information is, is welcome to, to add to this. But I felt it needed to, there needed to be an attempt made to kind of quantify and evaluate how bad this was because the Latvians themselves described this particular road, the battle at uh, Landek, as the 15th Division's Golgotha. Well, so is there enough of them to even re- reconstitute themselves into some shape or form afterwards once they get out? Well, the, the, the story that happens after the road of slaughter is, is just one of complete an utter disarray because the the Russians have gone north to Kolberg and uh, there's a big siege in Kolberg. 68,000 civilians are uh, shipped out of Kolberg in siege conditions. Oh, that's one of Hitler's strong points, isn't it? Festungs. It was a festung, yeah. So what that has done is basically split Pomerania. I mean, great tactics, great military strategy. They've, they've split Pomerania in two then the unit that's taken Kohlberg moves east to advance on Danzig and Gottenhafen, the base Gdansk and Gdynia, to put them under siege. And the only way out is by sea with all these ships, Operation Hannibal. Then you've got the terrible uh, shipping tragedies of the Wilhelm Gustlav and, and the Goya. Oh, it's hell on earth. Well, it's because the Latvians are the bottom of the lift to ship out as well, because the ethnic Germans, the Germans presumably, are getting out first. It's whoever can get on the boat, really. But in that same area, uh, um, geographically, uh, you've got the Charlemagne Division, which is smashed at Belgard, and you've got the XSS, which is also smashed and basically annihilated, and you've got the Korpsgruppe von Tetau, which survives but moves to the coast picking up refugees all along so they then regroup at a place called uh, Hof and Horst on the on the Baltic coast the stragglers coming in from everywhere and the commander there uh, von Tetau says what we need to do is create a corridor along the coast along the beach and we need to push the Russians back the Soviets back to allow ourselves a field of fire to hold them back. Um, And what's astonishing about that area, it's one of those things, it would be an amazing film. There are cliffs to the sea and then a flat beach. And so the escape route is along the beach, sheltered by the cliffs from the artillery that is shelling them. Uh, I mean, it's not a safe passage because, you know, thousands of people, it's absolute carnage on the beach and there are children, there are mothers all blown to pieces, there's horses, there's carts, there's all kinds of military stuff. And 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 really, 
quite grim descriptions of all this kind of stuff. You could, you could imagine how people would be scarred for life from having seen this kind of stuff. But anyway, the, the Latvians are part of this group to, to hold the, the Russians back and, and create this safe passage. And eventually they get to a place called Divanov, where there is a, another rearguard action and a big operation to get them off Pomerania, back to Germany, a uh, big Kriegsmarine uh, evacuation there, and they, they cross into Sweden, and, uh, and then the Russians basically soak up all of Pomerania. And then, it, historically, that then moves to the crossing of the Oder uh, episode. That's the next book. It's the next couple, actually, because in typical Latvian fashion, there are so many different endings. This is just the, uh, the period from uh, Danzig to the Oder. And, and they were split up into various groups. And, and one group under Colonel Janums uh, was sent to the southeast of Berlin and abandoned the positions to surrender to the Americans on the Elbe. Another group, the Recchi Battalion, the, the hardest, bravest, most decorated men, were sent into the centre of Berlin, which is something that isn't really charted in history. Many of the history books mention, oh, yes, there were Danes, there were Norwegians, you know, there were Spanish and Latvians. But I've got eyewitness accounts from what these Latvians did, and it is just staggering. So it's worth a book on its own. Now. Brilliant. Well, I look forward to the next book. Good stuff. Thanks, Vince. Um, as I said before we started, you've done an incredible job piecing it all together and adding some sense to actions that were chaotic. Folks, if you would like to know more about the Latvians during the Second World War, the book is The Road of Slaughter, the Latvian 15th SS Division in Pomerania, January, March 1945. For listeners of the podcast, Helian, the publisher, has offered us a discount code for copies of the book purchased from their website, helian.co.uk, and the code is VHRS10. That's the number 10. So that is helian.co.uk and use the offer code VHRS10. I'll put the code and links in the show notes. Now, if you have enjoyed this podcast and would like to support the show for a small monthly sum, you can sign up as a patron, which helps me find the time to put the show together. There are various levels of patronage, starting at the lowest level, where Patreon will give you a custom RSS feed so you can listen to the podcast advert free. At another tier, you will get extras, pieces of interview that never quite made it into the final cut. So to sign up, head to patreon.com slash ww2podcast. Next time I should be joined by World War II podcast regular John Trigg to discuss the air war over Germany. Until then, I'm Angus Wallace and thanks for listening. Eighty-eight millimeter gun hit our tongue, and blew us the hell out of it. The hell out of it. The hell out of it. Stalingrad can never be repaired. Be repaired. As Allied Commander in Chief, I have granted a military armistice.